Imagine you're on a beach in Australia. You're relaxing after surfing for a couple of hours. Your friend is on the other side of the world in Greece, and she's just posted an Insta story about the sea caves that she's exploring. You get a notification on your phone to view her Insta story. You look at it, and you like it. The question is, how is this possible in real time? Meta runs a truly global service due to the social nature of our products, and this is all enabled by our global backbone network. <clears throat> Let me tell you a little bit more about Meta's backbone. Meta operates one of the largest backbone networks in the world. It's a global network that connects over 25 data centers and 85 points of presence. We do this through millions of miles of fiber in both terrestrial and subsea routes, and with a backbone capacity that has grown over 30% year over year for the last five years. So how does AI impact this backbone? So starting around 2022, we started seeing demand for GPUs from our product groups like Facebook, WhatsApp, WhatsApp Instagram, et cetera. And this demand was limited, and it was asked for in small cluster sizes. Most of the traffic that was generated from this demand stayed within the data center, or at most, within the data center region. However, starting 2022, we started seeing a whole other picture. Demand for GPUs from our product groups grew over 100% year over year. <clears throat> and this was asked for in larger cluster sizes. Similar to what we had seen, in 2020 and 2021, we thought that this demand would stay within the data center, or at most within the data center region, but that was not the case. We saw a higher than anticipated uptick in growth in traffic on the backbone, and we were not ready for this. We had focused only on one stage of the AI lifecycle, which was to read from storage to feed into the GPUs, and we had missed several critical elements of this AI lifecycle. And Abhishek will talk more about this. We realized there was truly a lot more to understand to characterize the impact of AI on the backbone. So in our talk today, we'll cover four main areas. One, we'll talk about the AI lifecycle as seen through the backbone lens. Two, We'll talk about two steps in this AI lifecycle that have a large impact on the backbone, which is data replication and data placement. Three, we'll talk about solutions that we have implemented to solve these challenges to date. And four, we'll conclude the talk with some takeaways and a look ahead. With that, I'll pass it over to Abhishek to walk us through this AI lifecycle. Thank you, Jyotsna. <clears throat> and hello, everybody. I'm Abhishek Gopalan and I'm a network engineer at Meta, working on our global infrastructure since 2017. I'm really excited to be here and share more about what AI has meant for us, particularly on the network backbone. So with that, let's get into it. So as Jotsna was talking about this, it really helps understand what AI means to the backbone by looking at the whole life cycle of AI, and this would really help us kind of understand this better. So let's look at what that means and entails. So it's useful to kind of look at this through the major stages of a workload on what the life cycle is. So if you look at the first stage or the inception of what data actually gets ingested in our infrastructure, as you can imagine, there is a lot of data being created both by users and by machines. So <clears throat> this is really the initial part of where data actually shows up on our infrastructure. Now, leading off of that is the next stage that we call data preparation and placement. So as you can imagine, there is a whole life cycle around this where we need to figure out which data to place where and also ensure that it is protected for reliability reasons. And a key component is also about the freshness of data and how we manage that. <clears throat> and with that, after you have all of this is the notion of replications of data. Now, this is something we've had to do even pre-AI. And AI just like compounds this. And Jotsna will talk more about this as we get into the talk, but really, this is a key facet that also has a huge bearing on the backbone, as you can see here to the right. So 
really there are these key stages about how data moves, and you can almost think about this as a data life cycle, which is a very critical aspect to better understand what AI means, especially on the backbone. Now, this, this is really the part that we were referring to, which we weren't paying a lot of attention early on, but is essential to understand what it means for backbone dimensioning and how we can better support the <clears throat> nature of AI workloads. And only after you kind of reason through all of this, it, it is actually data flowing to the compute clusters where we're actually running AI training workloads. And even during this phase, we might use the backbone for things like checkpointing, where we want to ensure there is reliability if the region or the clusters where jobs are running actually go down. And after AI training, which is, again, grossly oversimplified here as a simple stage, and there is a lot more to it, as we will see from some of the other talks, the final stage, if you will, is really about after models are trained, we have to serve these models to the users, right? So to, this is really about, you can think of this as post-training or inference or serving as uh, people know here. So this is another space that today is somewhat modest on the backbone, but we're paying close attention to this and is a fast growing space. So that hopefully gives a broader picture of what the life cycle of an AI workload entails, especially when we want to kind of characterize what that means on the backbone. Now with that having said, let's look at how this showed up on our backbone. So if you look at this chart here we have, what we have here is two curves, one that's kind of AI-driven triggers and how that has manifested on the backbone over the years, and the other part here is the non-AI. So as you can see, a few years back, these were at par, and over time, the AI-driven needs have actually not only grown fast in volume, but also in, in, in the rate of growth, as you can see here. And the other key facet is the AI drivers, as you can see, are also quite volatile and hard to predict because of how dynamic the landscape is and which models kind of drive different needs. So that's really how uh, AI has showed up on our backbone. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Jyotsna to talk through a couple of unique challenges that AI has brought to us. Thanks, Abhishek. So let's dive a little bit deeper into the AI lifecycle that Abhishek just talked about. Now, we've had to support movement of data on our backbone, regardless of whether it is AI or non-AI traffic. So let's look at two, just going back a slide. Let's talk about the first two steps of this data lifecycle that Abhishek talked about, which is data ingestion and data preparation. There we go. So if you look at the um, data sets that are represented in green, this is new data that is constantly being generated from users or machines. And given the global nature of data collection, data consistency becomes key. The second step, which is related to data preparation, this includes deciding how many copies of the data we need. And this is represented in blue. You have a primary copy, you may have multiple secondary copies. And data persistence is actually something that applies to the most real-time, freshest data, as, which is represented in green, to the warm copies that are in blue, all the way to cold, cop cold storage copies that is represented in orange. Now, I mentioned before that we've, the, these two steps are actually applicable to both AI and non-AI traffic. <clears throat> so then how does AI change things? Three main things. One the need for fresh data, two, more copies, and three, just more volume of data. So if you look at step three, data replication, this is where we really start to see an impact on our backbone. So if you look at the picture on the left, the green regions are the regions that have data of interest and they house copies of popular data. The, that data set has to be moved to orange regions. This is where the training jobs have been set up. And once the training is complete, it has to move to the purple regions from where the AI traffic can be served. So you can see how there's a lot of movement between different regions. So with AI traffic, data over replication truly comes at a planetary scale. And it increases complexity, as I'd mentioned, for three main reasons. One, the high requirements for data freshness. Two, the number of times this data has to be moved. And three, just the scale, the volume of data that has to be moved, which is actually in the scale of exabytes. And we do this all on the backbone. We support this on our backbone 
through the millions of miles of fiber that we have and petabits of capacity. Let me talk about the second challenge on the backbone, which is related to data placement. So if you think about it, co-locating data and AI training in an ideal way is a very complex problem. So let's start with our upstream signals of demand and supply. Where do we get our demand signals from? From product groups that are asking for capacity. And especially in the AI world, the needs of these product groups are constantly evolving, which makes the demand signal volatile. Now on the other hand, you have supply constraints which leads to volatility. And these constraints could come in the, in, in the form of construction delays, changing geopolitical and regulatory environments, and a rapidly evolving market availability landscape. So outside of demand and supply, what makes data placement hard? What makes it hard about getting it correct? Answering the question of when, where, what and how much demand needs to be placed is a million dollar question. And getting the answer to this is critical. And it becomes an optimization problem. You have millions, sorry, you have dozens of product groups asking for demand and asking for it in different flavors. You have multiple dozens of physical sites where the demand can be placed, each of these physical sites with multiple buildings. And then you have a dozen hardware SKUs as well. When you put all of this together, you end up with millions of variables and millions of constraints, all of which have to be navigated before you can come up with a hardware placement plan first, and then subsequently a service placement plan. Where does AI add complexity? <clears throat> Two reasons. One, AI workloads are less fungible, and they just don't work as well with hardware heterogeneity. For example, an A100 versus an H100 server have different preferences for network hardware products. And secondly, as the demand and supply changes from upstream, uh, upstream signals change, it actually leads to migration complexities. And this is further exacerbated by the fact that AI, hard, AI workloads are just not as fungible with hardware heterogeneity. So I talked about the two main challenges of AI uh, on the backbone, and I'll hand it back to Abhishek to walk us through what solutions we've implemented to date to solve them. Thank you, Jyotsna. <clears throat> so that hopefully gives a glimpse of AI-specific challenges that have showed up. Now, I want to walk us through how we've been trying to address these challenges and also stay ahead. So let's talk through what we often call as bending the demand curve. So as you can imagine, the backbone is a precious resource and it's a shared infrastructure that we're using to support all of Meta's products and platforms. So one of the key lessons we've learned, especially with the advent of AI, is it really takes a holistic view of like working across the stack. So not just backbone or even network, but really going even beyond to work with compute, data, and storage teams to really understand better how these workloads show up and what we can do to better address these. So this is a key learning we've come to understand. And let's, let's take an example here to help us better understand what I mean by this. So what I have here is a simple chart for us to show specifically the use case of how fresh data, which was something that we had not paid a lot of attention to but kind of caught us off guard in how much that would be needed and what that means for the backbone. So if you look at that pie chart here, all you're seeing is even before projections of how AI would drive needs on the backbone, our networking costs for shuttling fresh data across our regions were starting to exceed our compute costs. So really, this made us think and go back to the drawing board to figure out what we can do better. And as we started to look at projections on how this might um, get projected, we were starting to see, as you can see from the curve on the, uh, on the top right there, the yellow, it would lead to an exponential growth in, on demand in the backbone. And wh what exactly is this demand? This is really about like cross-region reads, which is when data is fresh and lands in different regions in our infrastructure, other regions are starting to look and fetch that data. So we, if you did not be, if you weren't uh, intentional about how you shuttle that data, you're basically doing all of that on the backbone. And that is gonna be untenable as it grows. So, on this specific example, we actually work with our storage teams to better understand this through this rubric of cost of ownership, as you can see here, that it would be more judicious 
to make more efficient use of the backbone in this specific case, and we would trade that off with more caching and better data placement strategies. And this has already helped us bend that curve from that yellow to the blue, where we're now limiting our cross-region reads to just two-thirds of data that has to go across when new data lands. And we have more opportunities outlined on how we can further bend this demand curve. So that's just one example that we kind of looked at on how we handle the explosion of the need for fresh data for our various AI models. Now, there are other examples that we are working through where, as Jyotsna talked about earlier, about over-replications, which is something that AI has uniquely brought to the table, we are looking to better observe and understand which data sets are actually useful, because sometimes we might shuttle data that doesn't get used or is kind of waiting. So in all of these cases, building better instrumentation and observability of how data flows is a key facet of how we've come to bend that demand curve. And similarly, not all workloads need data at the same types of latency guarantees. So all of this is uh, different aspects, as you can see, which we are really looking to better uh, design the backbone in a more efficient manner while still be meeting the needs of AI. Now, with that, I do want to kind of step back a little bit and reinforce that a backbone is really for all workloads, not just AI, right? So, and we've been operating a differentiated class of service network on the backbone with different QoS guarantees for different workloads. And this is something we've doubled down and leaned heavily on to also address the needs of AI. Because as I was just talking about, there are a, a spectrum of workloads, not all of which need the same uh, service guarantees. And similarly, we've also tapped into temporal opportunities on the backbone, by which I mean, as you can imagine, there are ebbs and flows on the usage of the network. And if there are workloads that can really harness that, uh, we look to do that so that we make better use of the backbone. So with that, I want to kind of like touch, just close it. There is a lot more opportunity here, going back to the tenet of like kind of optimizing across the stack. There are always opportunities of optimizing across compute and storage systems. And that's a pretty complex problem at our scale, as you can imagine. Now, Having said that, I want to switch gears a little bit to talk about what we often call expanding the supply curve. So complementary to kind of bending the demand curve, we want to make sure we stay ahead. So similar to how we've learned that it takes optimization across the stack, we've also looked at designing across the physical infrastructure. So what this means is really looking across power, cooling, and various other aspects alongside network solutions to enable AI workloads. And Really, this is about ensuring, and it might be obvious why we want to do this, right? So we want to make sure we can enable product innovation, absorb inorganic growth in our demand, and ensure we're always kind of unblocking business needs, as, because network is really about ensuring that we build the right infrastructure. And how do we do this? This, this really translates to buying space and power, procuring fiber, and ensuring that our network infrastructure is ready for demand that might come at us while also being you know, intentional about bending that demand curve. And we, in terms of the mechanics of how we actually also use that supply is we intentionally design our backbone to allow for more flexible demand patterns as well as allow for more workload optionality. So that then allows our uh, backbone to really serve potential spikes or changes in demand patterns which aren't always easy to predict as we saw from some of the earlier charts. So, with that, that hopefully gives a glimpse of how we're addressing the challenges of AI on the backbone. And I want to welcome Jatsna back to help wrap for us. Thanks, Abhishek. So what did we learn today? We thought that the impact of AI on the backbone was going to be small. But data replication, data placement, and high requirements for data freshness has a large impact. The impact of large clusters, Gen AI, AGI, is yet to be learned. We haven't yet fully flushed out what that means on the backbone. And all of this is happening at a very high speed and a rapid rate of innovation. So this is an extremely exciting time to be at Meta. So we invite us to, to join us on this journey ahead. I leave you with one last closing thought. The next time you see your friends' Insta stories from across the world, and you get this sense of closeness as though you're sitting shoulder to shoulder, sharing life's small moments. Think about how this is possible due to Meta's backbone. Thank you. Thank you.